this lecture is about data and file structures. I'm going to start with data structures. I'm going to mention a few different popular data structures used in programming. So the first one is an array and this is used for storing data of the same type. So when you declare it, you, you will give it an example, a data type of whole number integer, followed by an array name and normally a size, so 10 integers. So this is an example of how you would write it in many different C-based languages. So you access it via a variable name, myarray in this case, and you use the index 0 to, in this case, 9, because we have 10 elements, so it would be myarray 0 all the way to myarray 9, like this. So for example, if it's if it's integers, then you would you would want to put say a number into an element. You could set it quite easily so that contains the number nine, for example, in array position zero, in array position one that might contain the number three. So whatever you're using it for, you can randomly access different parts of an array by just referring to the specific index. So if there are 10 elements, you can refer to any of the 0 to 9 elements just using the array index. So it's a random access data structure. So it's quick to access, but maybe slow to move things around and sort it. Sort it. So here's an example. If you wanted to process the different ages in, in maybe a cohort, say about 1,000 students, uh, you could use an array of a thousand elements, 0 to 999, and put all the, all the ages in there, or you could have separate variables. But it would be very inefficient to have a thousand separate variables. In, in essence, they are actually the same because they're all integers. So that could be, say, each number is a 16-bit value. And in this case, it, it is pretty much the same. Although, if you've only filled... Um, a portion of the array in subsystems it can be more efficient but essentially this is using up the same space and doing the same thing except how you access them is using the the index and the, they're stored together okay so they can store any type in this case we we have this as an integer but they could be text characters for example character strings they could be whole structures of data, which I'll mention in a moment. So in this case, they're whole number integers. You often use a loop, so a for each or something like that, depending on the language, to process each element of the array. Or something like for i equals 0, i less than 10 or 9 or whatever. I++ as a C-based language, and then you can look at each my array I. So do something with it, yeah? So current equals my array I, and then do something with it. Obviously, if you've got a block of code, you have the curly brackets. So yeah, you would normally use a loop to process the elements, and normally that would be a for loop because you know how many elements are in, in the array. So in terms of searching an array, you have to check each element when you're searching through the array, unless obviously the index is part of your search. For example, you may have a series of grades starting from 0, 1, 2, 3, whereby a 0 means a referral, a pass a minus, so not a very good pass, a pass plus, a pass equals. And, and it may be that you just want to print out the long form, so it might be pass minus in the array, if you see what I mean. So, sorry about this, it's a bit messy. So it might be that you want to look at array zero and you might want to print grade array, say one, and then you'd get the word pass minus instead of one. So you could use it as a grade lookup or you could use it for the number of days in a month, so array element, so month array. One would be equal to January. Uh, sorry, how many days are in January? 
all right that sort of thing so you could use it to store that type of data and it'd be quite quick then to access it can be accessed in a random high speed way otherwise you'd have to actually check each element when searching through the array adding and removing data can be more difficult and it could leave gaps in the data as you're moving data around so it could take a while to actually um, manipulate the data in the array and you might need to move all of the data to leave gaps if you want to put it in order as well and you have multiple dimensional arrays so they're sort of 2d arrays like this for example a bit more complicated they're often used for graphics representing images so positioning of items all sorts of different things I'm not going to go too much into those because again this is an overview so I'm going to mention data records and structures because these are often the same thing but in C and you'll find these in in other languages it depends on what language you're using I can't, my writing is terrible it allows the grouping of data so you have fields so for example in C there is this um, address structure and it will have various different types of data all making up the whole address so the IP address whether it's TCP or UDP this is for um, uh, datagram and this is for connection oriented so connection oriented and, and that's to specify the type of communication that you want the IP address the port so it all goes into a structure um, you can have arrays of these so for example IP address 0 dot family IP address dot address IP address dot port so you would access the individual fields using the dot notation in the case of a straightforward record so a record a structure could be um, IP address and then inside it you would say int port you might say character IP address or address sorry and then you might put that as eight I'm making this up as I go along but this is like a structure now and then you can have your um, IP address would then be like a data type and you can call it my array so 10 of those or something so an array of these which is structures again just academic for now if you need to use it you would obviously study them a little bit more but they're quite useful to have and a lot of systems level programming uses data structures so unix systems programming if you're going to do that you need to know records and structures so another area is stacks and queues I'm just going to give you an example of those with stacks you can have a structure obviously a data structure of a stack and where your data might be say integers going on to the stack it could be all sorts of things it could be character strings and the data goes into the stack using a push and it comes out of the stack using a pop so four six so when you push the data in so six and you pop you will get a six back and then clear that location the next time you pop you would get a three the next time you'd get a four stacks are good for undo operations that's a really useful one can you think of other uses of a stack where the data that goes in is the last data that comes out so that's last in first out a leafo in the case of a queue let's use a different color for the queue just to differentiate you have data going in I'm oh, sorry about my lack of ability to draw you've got data goes in six four three six and it comes out the other end as you would imagine a queue to work in the real world so the data goes in first in first out FIFO LIFO these are used 
traditionally for data communication systems. So the data is being sent and it's being queued. So this could be requests for information. It could be, can you think of some? That's the point. Can you think of examples of what would use a FIFO and examples of what would use a LIFO? I've given you two. Store in the last operation. They're also used in the pro, uh, in a computer to store the functions that are being used. It's used for arithmetic, bod mass. So it's used for a number, number of things. And these are traditionally for queuing tasks, queuing requests, queuing things that need to happen, often used for inter-process communication. OK, so another popular data structure is the linked list. Important that you know about the linked list. This is where each element knows about the next element. So with an array, you have an index. It kind of knows about itself. In a linked list, you have some data, whatever that data is, and then what's called a pointer, PTR, pointer, to the next item of data, wherever that might be on the disk. And they don't need to be consecutive. They could be all over the place. It could be fragmented. So you need the pointer to the start of your data and then you can find the next, the next and the next. They can start off empty, so with just one item and dynamically grow. It's easy to add items in order. So you can go to say, say, say this was a A, B, D, E, start a word beginning with those and you wanted to put C in there. So what you would do is you would find B but you go one past it, you realize that's too much, so you go back, you, you take the pointer, you make your new element with your, your link, and instead of linking to that one, you link to that one, and you make that one link to that one, and cross it out. So it's quite easy to insert data in comparison to an array, so unlike arrays. The variable that you use points to the address in memory, so it's an address in the computer's memory, which is a pointer. And that's what that is. So you would start off with a pointer to your first address in memory. OK, and this is how you might do it. You might say, I have a pointer to a pile of integers. And you'd have a pointer to the first one. All right, so that's your integer so your number three for example and then that would that one would point to your next one and that one will point to your next one so all you have is this one so this value here is pointing to that one there the start the memory address of where you will find this item they're called nodes is the correct academic term for them nodes and they contain a pointer to the next and the data itself they may also have a previous pointer. Some, some are implemented with next and previous. So they're doubly linked lists. They can be stored in non-contiguous locations in memory. And that's because, I mean, that could start off in, say, memory address 1016. And this one could start off in 409 six i'm just making those numbers up but they don't need to be close to each other linked lists are used a lot for file systems and storing data uh, used by system programs they're very efficient but you do need to know which is the most appropriate data structure to use so there's an example of your linked list a little bit neater than on my previous page in comparison to an array so in terms of data storage, they're a little bigger in some respects in that you have this extra address here. But there are the advantages and disadvantages. If you're going to be adding data throughout, you know, throughout the linked list on a regular basis, then a linked list is, is good. Like your file system, constantly making files, removing files. Linked lists are much better than an array. For example, if you were making an operating system, you, pr you wouldn't use an array 
for your actual file system, but you may use it for ordered data, which is quick to search or data where you want to randomly access certain elements. So it depends on what you need to use it for. It's very useful to actually compare data structures and choose the right one. So with linked lists, you do have to go from one to the other because you, you really don't know what it is you're looking for. So when you're searching, you have to go from one to, to the next. So it can be a bit slower, but it is easier when it comes to adding and removing items. So really do need to understand the difference before you select the most appropriate data structure. OK, now we're moving on to the file structures. You have different types of files. So we have a sequential files where the whole file is kept together and there's an EOF marker to indicate that's the end of the file. I'm going to change my pen color, stop using the red. So EOF is a marker to indicate the end of the file. CSV files, mail merge files, they're all normally stored in one place. They're not very efficient for storing things like databases. Bearing in mind a database is essentially just a file, but you have some program, very complex program, that knows how to process the data, how it's formatted. So like with arrays, they are slow to update. They're difficult to add data into them. Um, for example, complex data. So you have random indexed files or hashed files. These are normally used for databases, sequential files, but with an index. Now you can imagine an index is like a book. You have a, se a small separate area at the back where you can indicate specific data might be or, or where it might start. So like an index in a book, it might be that you're looking for a certain amount of data but you only have one that's close to it but at least that gives you a starting point to quickly go to access your data bear in mind files can be huge they could have millions and millions of records so and and remember a database is just a file when it's on actually on disk so accessing data in an indexed file will often involve loading the index file which is smaller into memory finding the thing you want, then using the address that you've found to go to the area on disk and then you can continue looking from there. So that's a heck of a lot quicker. That's if you're using that type of index. There are other indexes and other indexes which you, you don't involve a file at all or, or you may have both. You may have a file to get you close and then the da data might be in, in order. So it depends on the amount of data. But if the data's in order, you can generally get close to it and then carry on searching from that point onwards. A bit like a dictionary um, or an encyclopedia or a catalogue where you go to the back, you find the page of this, a sort of category and then you go and search through from there. It's a lot quicker. OK, so that's indexed files. Um, hashed files are a little bit different in that there is a mathematical function for telling you where items are on the disk. It doesn't need an extra file. It uses a function to work out where, where to actually look. Now, this is quite complex to go into detail. I mean, if you're interested in this, then go and explore hashing and modular division hashing and so on in more detail. There's a couple of key terms that you can go and look up but it's a little bit much for this introduction. OK, so directories. I mean, most of us are now using the world, the word folder in Windows. But directory is still very much used in Linux, Mac, you know, when you're when you're actually on the operating system and your Raspberry Pi which is Linux and as such, and obviously Unix. So directories are a tree structure. So you'll start off in Linux with your root and then, oops, I didn't mean to pick it up. And then you will have your user, your bin, 
these are all directory names your s bin static binaries your var and so on all all the different directories and then underneath these oh you've got your etc for example and then underneath these you'll have more directories so it's a tree like structure as you can see it starts from the top from one and then carries on obviously it's upside down because these are all the branches so every linux file system has an inode number if you haven't actually learnt about this then you might want to go to my files and directories linux files and directories video and have a little look at this um, directories contain files and the files are stored as linked lists so useful to actually understand all of these different data structures finally as this is just an overview i'm going to just cover a little bit on text and a little bit on what binary uh, how to differentiate so text or ascii character text ascii characters are often found on the keyboard they're what you expect a human to enter so human readable generally so you you know your letters your numbers anything that you you can type in your special characters full stops and so on that's your ascii data the data is not represented in other formats i.e floating points so a 16 for example will be ascii oops if you're not sure about all of this you need to go back to my first video on binary and number systems where i go over what ascii is i compare it with other data types and and there's another one on data storage as well so both of those together will help you understand this but it is a seven bit well it uses eight bits but seven bits are used for your 128 characters like your letters and your numbers your uppercase and your lowercase and your special characters so that's 128 and, and the the rest of them are used for special characters but you can't store your data as floating point a program that reads this data will read it as ascii character data okay whereas in terms of binary files the data storm stored in a format that the computer needs it's meaningful to the program that proce processed it so it's very application specific the data will be the, the data that's stored in the file will be understood by the application so it might be that the first two bit two bytes are known as an integer and read as an integer and stored into an integer variable whereas in an ascii file they will be two ascii characters okay so the data is expected to be if the data is expected to be an integer and then two or more bytes of data etc then that's what the app will read it as and store it as a good way of understanding this is to actually have a look at an example where the same binary data represented in two bytes could mean two different things for example it could mean two set uh, two eight bit characters or it could mean an integer which are very very different things altogether so looking at the ascii table ascii table.com thank you for your resource you'll see that the letter a is equivalent to decimal 65 and b is 66 which would be represented in binary let's choose two easy ones for example the number one so number 10 would be a 49 and a 48 to so a 49 and a 48 for the number one and the number zero i'm just going to do that so 49 and 48 let me just check that again so 48 is a 0 and 49 is a 1 48 is a 0 and 49 is a 1 in ascii 
So if you put your binary 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, in order to get your 1, that would be obviously a 32. That's 32 plus 16 is 48. And 1, that makes your 1. And to make your 0, so the bits that you would see to make 14, uh, 1, 0, 1, 0 in ASCII would be 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0. So that's ASCII representation. But take the number 10 as an integer and that will be 0, 1, 0, 1 and then a whole load of zeros. So that's 10 as an integer. Hopefully you can see that, hopefully you can see that this here is 10 as an integer and this here is 10 as two ASCII values. So they're very different. So in the case of binary files, you you would need to make sure that it is clear that the program knows that this is this is definitely an integer and this is definitely two ASCII values, two, two characters, if you like. So it's very important to understand what you're dealing with. So finally, a quick summary. Covered data and file structures as an overview. In terms of data structures, I've mentioned arrays. Just a quick go back over that. I've shown you that it's it's better to have an array than lots of individual separate variables, although spaces in the save and it's easier to work with. I've shown you that it's it can be quicker to access data, but very difficult to add and remove data. I've shown you the difference between a stack and a queue, mention what some of these things are used for. Linked lists, sorry about the messy slide. Um, they're very difficult to find data. They can be non-contiguous in memory, but diff uh, easier to add and remove items from the linked list. They're used by the file system. And there's an example in comparison with an array. Again, space-wise, there's probably a little more for the linked list, but it does depend on what you need to use it for. Mention file structures. So different types of file mentioned sequential where you have an end of file marker and you can read the data until end of file is reached. So it's often used for CSV, mail merge files, not very good for large databases. Index files, you can randomly access the file um, using different methods, say an index or a hashed file. I suggested you go and look more into hashing method, me sorry, methods. Um, indexing, I mentioned about there's different ways. You can either store the data in order and have a small index, or you can have your data in not in order and just rely completely on an index. Database systems do often use this method for allowing you to store and access your data. Hashing algorithms provide for a much more complex data storage, but they can be a lot, a lot quicker. And if you want to, like I said, go and have a little look, look at direct hashing or modulo division hashing just for academic interest. Then I mentioned directories saying they're a tree like structure, it's showing you an example of how they are laid out. Um, we use the term folder in Windows, but directory in every other system. Files are stored in linked lists, but the Linux file system has an inode number, which is referred to in the directory. Um, so it has like an index number, which the directory will keep a copy of. And then that will point to the start of the file, the linked list that holds it. Then I mentioned text versus binary files, which is very important to understand where binary is meaningful data, but is generally not understood by any editor. So you couldn't really open it in a text editor because it will mean something different. And I showed an example of why that might be the case using the, the number 10. 10 stored as a 1 and a 0 in ASCII. So a 1 is 49 and a 0 is 48. And when shown as two 8-bit values next to each other, that would amount to quite a large number. Whereas 
10 as an integer, that's what it looks like. So they're very different and it's important that you understand what, what you are working with. So hopefully that makes some sort of sense. And that was an overview on data and file structures.